Well, uh, welcome to the second lecture for the uh, study trip, HIH 2001. In the first lecture, we covered the Baltic region in general, what it was like prior to the arrival of uh, uh, German and Germanic crusaders on the southern shore of the Baltic in the uh, late 12th and early 13th century. Now today we're going to focus in particular on the arrival of the Teutonic Knights, this German Crusading Order, uh, which turns up in the early 1230s in the uh, area that we think of now as Prussia and slowly colonize it. But I want to, within this lecture, not just jump in with the arrival of the Teutonic Order in Prussia, but give you a bit of a background on the order uh, where they come from and how they got there. You know, wh why were they interested in crusading against pagans? We tend to think about crusading orders as orders that, or excuse me, uh, well, orders of uh, 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 holy monks, for example, or warrior monks. We tend to think of them as fighting the uh, Muslims in the Levant. So how do these people end up fighting? Well, uh, I'm going to start from ground zero here. So what, what is a crusade? Uh, I think we, we all think we know what a crusade is because we use this word in, in, you know, very uh, often in slang and expressions. But I want to focus here on uh, the origins of the crusading movement and, and how those contribute to the foundation of the Tonic Knights. So uh, what is a crusade? Well, the papacy in Rome... Uh, is growing in authority up to around the year uh, 1000. Uh, it's becoming not just the... Uh, Rome is becoming not just the seat of the Bishop of Rome, but the Bishop of Rome is <coughs> growing in importance as the leader of all uh, what we'd call Latin uh, Christians in uh, the West of Europe. Christianity is divided between two uh, main rites. Uh, I say Latin because uh, what we'd loosely associate with uh, Catholic Christianity today has its origins in the medieval church, and the uh, main part of the weekly church service, the mass, the elevation of the host, that was conducted through the medium of, of the Latin language because, of course, uh, Rome was the center of the Roman Empire, and when the empire Christianizes, uh, Christianity to a certain extent flows out into the provinces through the old sinews of the empire uh, which used Latin as its official language and so Latin becomes the language through which pe Christians worship in the western uh, parts of Europe the old western Roman Empire and so uh, Latin Christian Latin based Christianity uh, focused on the authority of the Pope in Rome grows uh, rapidly in importance in this period. The other form of Christianity being uh, Orthodox Christianity focused on uh, Constantinople, today called Istanbul, which was the capital of the eastern part of the old Roman Empire. Uh, and of course missionaries from that uh, part of Europe where Mass was celebrated in Greek in particular, in Greece, Constantinople, uh, people from that region uh, sent missionaries to Russia, which is why even today we have Orthodox, as it's called, Christianity in Russia and uh, Greece, and Latin Christianity uh, in the West focused on Rome. Well, that, uh, uh, I think, rather important digression aside, we get back to the main story here, which is to say that up until about the year 1000, the papacy is growing in importance. Remember how I said that uh, King Stephen of Hungary received uh, a, uh, a crown from the Pope and uh, papal recognition of his position of King of the Hungarians in the year 1000 when he agrees that he will convert uh, the Hungarian people to Christianity. Uh, that is, is kind of the Pope playing politics, and that would only grow. For example, in 1066, when William the Conqueror wants to press his claim to be King of England, he goes to the Pope and receives a special banner that his soldiers carry into battle when they reach England, signifying that he has papal support. So this is a really ambitious period for the papacy. Prohibitions are put in place uh, against 
Christians killing other Christians. Uh, the church uh, tries to punish uh, by expelling from the church uh, people who uh, conduct private wars against other Christians. So this, this kind of military or militaristic society, its, its energy goes from being focused internally to be focused externally. And in March 1095, uh, the Byzantine emperor, this uh, chap based in Constantinople, what today is uh, Istanbul, uh, Emperor Alexos seeks the help of uh, Roman Pope Urban II to defend Constantinople against the Seljuk Turks, and he he says, "Look, they've they've already uh, conquered uh, uh, Jerusalem and areas on the East Mediterranean, and now they're they're coming uh, coming for the ancient city of Constantinople. Can you help?" So Pope Urban II uh, convenes what's called the Council of Clermont. In uh, 1095, where there's an artistic depiction here of it here on the right um, from a much later period, of course, but he gets in a, a number of churchmen and he effectively holds a conversation and eventually uh, issues a statement saying, "Let those who have been accused unjustly to wage private warfare against the faithful uh, now go against the infidel and end with victory this war, which should have been begun long ago." And he's referring here to a, a war against uh, Muslims to uh, reclaim the holiest sites in Christianity, particularly Jerusalem, uh, uh, from Muslim peoples. He says, let those who for a long time have been robbers now become knights. Let those who have been fighting against their brothers and relatives now fight in a proper way against the barbarians. Let those who have been serving as mercenaries for small pay now obtain the eternal reward let those who have been wearing themselves out in both body and soul now work for a double honor, for their own honor and then for the and also for the honor of God is what he's suggesting. Now this uh, call to crusade has a lasting uh, impact because the idea of crusading springs from this point and of course would carry on uh, in many forms throughout the Middle Ages. The First Crusade goes to the Holy Land in, well, at least effectively it's called in 1095. Uh, it's 1099 by the time an army on foot makes it all the way to the Near East. Uh, and it's viewed by those who walk this terribly long way as a penitential journey, i.e. A, uh, a journey in which you, you suffer along the way, but you, you do it as a penance for your sins, seeking salvation in service of God. Uh, and uh, when you head out on this, this, this journey of suffering for a, a reward in the afterlife, uh, in the name of Christ, uh, you normally, you, you, uh, in later times, you particularly, you pin, uh, the, you pin a cross, usually made of fabric, to your own clothing, uh, and to take the vow to go on this penitential journey as a crusader is called to take the cross. Now, ultimately, 100,000 warriors and ordinary men and women walk to the Holy Land in the First Crusade and capture Jerusalem on the 15th of July, 1099, against all odds, uh, more than half of them having died or been whittled, up, whittled down along the way. Uh, but from the very beginning, uh, a crusade need not necessarily have been to the Holy Land. I mean, the fame of the First Crusade is what... and and its unlikely su success from a Western point of view uh, is what grounds crusading culture uh, you know, in the minds, in the fabric of Western European society for hundreds of years to come. I suppose if it had been a dreadful failure, people would have forgotten it and moved on. Uh, but uh, from the very beginning of this crusading movement, the crusade need not necessarily have been to the Holy Land. Uh, the same pope who called for the First Crusade, Urban II, he spoke to Spanish royals. And you've got to remember, at this point in the Middle Ages, uh, um, the greater part of Spain was in the possession of Muslim rulers who had, in the 8th century, uh, invaded Spain from North Africa. And uh, speaking to Spanish royals, Urban II had said, uh, we don't quite know when, but somewhere between 1096 and 99, he'd said that, 
if the knights of other provinces had decided with one mind to go to the aid of the Asian church, and he's referring there to the Orthodox church based in Constantinople, and to liberate their brothers from the tyranny of the Saracens, so ought you with one mind and our encouragement to work with greater endurance to help a church so near you to resist the invasions, because there's no virtue to rescue Christians of one place, uh, only to expose them to tyranny and oppression in another. So Urban II himself was okay with the idea of crusades uh, to help Christians at the fringes of Europe, uh, not just to fight against uh, Muslim persons. Uh, and the success of the First Crusade means that this crusading movement gets off the ground, and so the two come together eventually in crusades uh, to other places. Now I want to point out on this uh, map here uh, how far flung the kind of centers of conflict between uh, Christians and non-Christians are. So if we look first at the bottom left of the map here, uh, you'll see most of uh, most of the Iberian Peninsula here, uh, this is a map from a slightly later period, but most of the Iberian Peninsula here is still in uh, the uh, hands of the Almighty Caliphate uh, in the year one, you know, in the year uh, uh, 1095. Uh, but the uh, Spanish nobility and the uh, nobility of France make steady progress in this period to push them out, which leads to the creation of the Spanish kingdoms of Castile, Leon, Aragon, and uh, of course uh, the Kingdom of Portugal progressively over the uh, 13th, 14th century. Uh, when a second crusade is called a generation after the first uh, in the 12th century, one of the main objectives of the second crusade is in fact uh, to liberate Lisbon, lib liberate in inverted commas there, to liberate Lisbon here in Spain. At the same time, other persons in the Second Crusade uh, are headed off to Jerusalem at the other extreme edge of uh, Christendom uh, to fight here. Uh, you'll notice that really there's a kind of triangle here formed by Lisbon, Jerusalem, and the area that we're interested in here in the extreme north of Europe where the last pagan peoples, or almost the last pagan peoples of Europe live up here in what today is uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, um, and Prussia, uh, which of course since World War II has been absorbed into Poland, uh, just here, that being our destination. Now I want you to try and keep this map in mind if you can, and also to keep in mind this little area here, which is on the south coast of the Baltic between the base of the Danish Peninsula and uh, Prussia. There's a little place here. Again, it's now uh, uh, divided between what's modern Germany and Poland on the south coast of the Baltic, but it was occupied by a group of pagans called the Wends. Uh, and they're absorbed or converted to Christianity uh, just before, or not long before, Germanic persons move on this final bastion uh, of pagan religion in the Northeast. I'll explain that in due course here. So as I said, the Second Crusade is called effectively a generation after the first. Uh, it, it uh, in the main, runs between 1147 and 1149. It's called by Pope Eugenius III, uh, on the one hand, it's in response to the Muslim rollback of some of the conquests of the First Crusade that reached the Holy Land in 1098 and captured Jerusalem in 1099. Uh, but it's also, uh, on the part of Eugenius, an attempt to make a name for himself in the way that Urban II had made a name for himself by uh, really founding and organizing, to a certain extent, the First Crusade. Now, the Second Crusade has three parts. The first part uh, goes to the Holy Land. Uh, it's ultimately ineffective, and it was to fight against the Muslims. The second part, as I mentioned, it goes to what's now Portugal, 
uh, and it results in the quote-unquote liberation of Lisbon, that is to say the con conquest of Lisbon uh, from the Umayyads. Uh, but the third part, and here's the really what seems on the surface of it anomalous bit, uh, it's against the pagans. Uh, against those winds, uh, the windish people in the northeast of Europe on the Baltic coast. So a letter is already circulating in 1108, so you know here we are nearly 40 years before the Second Crusade, written by a Flemish priest of uh, Magburg, purporting to be from uh, the archbishop uh, of that city. Uh, the letter is directed to the men of Mans Cologne uh, in the you know, in what's now Germany, or as it was called then, the Holy Roman Empire. And it says, Most cruel Gentiles, men without mercy and in their humanity, glorying in malice, have arisen against us and prevailed. They have profaned uh, the church of idolatry. They have torn down altars. They invade our regions very frequently. They lay waste, uh, ill overthrow, and afflict. Uh, with chosen torments, they behead, disembowel, dismember, and so, dearest brothers, in all of Saxony, France, Lorraine, and Flanders, so is a, a call to people across uh, across Northern Europe. Uh, follow the good example, and he's referring here to the good example of the First Crusade. Prepare holy war, rouse up the strong, arise, princes, take up your shields against the enemies of Christ. Uh, this is a type of rhetoric that was used against Muslims at the time, uh, particularly following the First Crusade, but here it's directed at our uh, pagans. Now it's interesting uh, uh, that the suggestion is that these Wendish pagans are invading and destroying uh, Christian areas of, uh, you know, of of Germany, when the reality is that that's a movement is already beginning this period, something that would eventually be called the Ossiedlung, the uh, sort of eastern settlement, whereby uh, Germans were in fact migrating slowly east uh, and clear clearing the land and building farms. And so uh, the tenor of this letter is that somehow German lands being invaded when in fact it probably reflects pushback against German inroads into previously pagan territories. The Second Crusade strongly associated with uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. Uh, keep in mind, uh, it was a co the Council of Clairvaux that leads the First Crusade. In 1146, St. Uh, Bernard, Bernard of Clairvaux preached the crusade inside Germany. Uh, concerns about Slavic neighbors, these Wendish people being Slavs rather than uh, Germanic. Uh, concerns about these Wendish Slavic neighbors hold back some uh, Saxons, North Germans, from participating in the Second Crusade. On the 13th of March, 1147, uh, St. Bernard meets with Saxon nobles uh, at Reichstag, uh, at Frankfurt, and he, he tries to kind of allay their concerns, and uh, at some point in the midst of this, uh, the discussions that come out of this, is an agreement that actually it's it's okay to fight against uh, Slavs because they're not Christian either or against Wends uh, and that that's a suitable alternative to going to the Holy Land. Uh, this is reflected in a 13 April 1147 papal bull. Uh, the word bull means an official edict when it comes to the Pope. Uh, so Eugenius III issues a special papal bull uh, called uh, uh, divina disp dispensione, which literally means divine dispensation, i.e. Uh, your, your sins will be dispensed of by God or forgiven. Your sins will be forgiven by God if you do this thing. And it says, for those who have decided to go against the Slavs and to remain in the spirit of devotion on that expedition, as it is, as it is prescribed, we grant the same remission of sin in the same temporal privileges as to the Crusaders. And so this is a document that effectively makes it equally okay uh, and grants equal rewards to fight against pagan Slavs as to fight against uh, uh, Muslims in the Near East. This basically authorizes a Northern Crusade. 
and makes it equal to the crusade at Jerusalem. Uh, this is what's uh, sometimes first call, called the first, quote-unquote, first northern crusade. Uh, you'll see some volumes and reading list uh, for this module about the, quote-unquote, northern crusades. Well, this is the first of them here. It is a local, uh, it is really a local dimension uh, that's added for the benefit of, of these Saxon and German nobles that are worried about their neighbors rather than uh, more than they're worried about the good of the Christian people uh, in the Near East. Now this isn't, the First Northern Crusade isn't just uh, a crusade of Germans, uh, Danes uh, and indeed Poles who have by this point in time long been, since been converted to Christianity they also participate. So it's not against all Slavs, um, uh, Poles like the Winds are Slavic people, uh, but rather it's against pagan Slavs, and that's a, an important distinction. There's a legacy uh, of the Second Crusade and the strictly Northern Crusades that, that would rattle on a whole culture of calling for just crusades to the north emerges. There are, are to be no truces with uh, pagan persons in the course of a northern crusade, only baptism and conversion or continued war. That's a, a kind of basic premise. Uh, forced baptism of subject peoples is considered okay. Reverting to paganism after you've been baptized, even if it was forced, moves you from one category to another. So if you're a pagan person, you might be resisting Christians, but uh, you don't know about Christianity. And so they'll conquer you and force you to take baptism. But if you know about Christianity and choose to leave it, that makes you an infidel, i.e. an unfaithful person. Uh, so you've actively rejected uh, Christianity and therefore you're a much worse person than the old pagan who just didn't know about it. Uh, infidels are subject to death in theory. So a kind of pattern emerges here where missionaries go into pagan Slavic lands they set up they try to convert people inevitably at some point their things go wrong they're attacked and then after they're attacked a German Danish or Polish Christian military intervention follows uh, leading to a, a kind of military uh, outpost in conjunction with the you know small church or whatever has been founded to convert people so the you know the uh, uh, well-meaning priest goes in he uh, uh, is rejected on the back of that rejection the military come in to sort of support him and then that leads in a roundabout way to conquest a German outpost is established at Riga uh, by 1158 and this is the first instance of a, a really a, a, the creation of a totally new um, a colonial community stuck on a point in the coast which is physically disconnected or geographically disconnected from other Christian areas and so that, that's quite an important sort of shift this isn't about the neighbors anymore this is about going way the heck up there uh, to Riga and sort of founding the nucleus of a new Christian community. Now in 1193, Pope Celestine III, uh, you know, he, he calls another uh, northern crusade, as a result of which uh, Livonia is founded. Uh, Livonia is the, the uh, uh, old name for the area which today encompasses more or less uh, uh, Latvia and Estonia. But at this point, it's it's really focused on, on just Riga and around Riga. Campaigns are led by Saxons from numerous campaigns in the summer, invariably between 1198 and 1212, conquering this area around Riga. Bishop Elbert of Riga arrives in 1201. He founds his own crusading order called the Livonian Sword Brothers. And they're a, a little bit of a shady bunch, as we'll come to see, uh, you know, over the course of time. He really just kind of scrapes up a, a coalition of the willing among uh, various warlike nobles trundling over from the west, and strikes a deal with them 
a little bit more like you'd strike a deal with some unruly mercenaries uh, than help than getting help from a you know <laughs> if there is such a thing get, than getting help from a well-meaning crusading order. Uh, two thirds of conquests of the sword brothers from pagans are to go to the church, and one third to the sword brothers. So these guys, uh, as an order, uh, they're getting you know a lot of uh, financial uh, reward here as well. In 1199, Pope Innocent the uh, Third he calls a, a Livonian another you know Livonian crusade, and as a result of that, Estonia is founded. Estonia is, of course, the northernmost uh, of the Baltic states as we know them today. Uh, I'll show you a map in, in due course here. Uh, the Danes come by sea. They land on the north northwest coast of what's now Estonia, led by the Danish king, uh, Valdmar II, uh, in 1219. So if you want to put this in a context of your British historical knowledge, you know, this is a, uh, just after the reign of bad, bad King John. Uh, we're seeing the foundation of what would become uh, ultimately a very, very long time later uh, the, sta the Christian state of Estonia. So here's a map of the region uh, just to bring you back up to speed here. So if we get my pointer out. Uh, so here we are. Uh, this is the Baltic here, if you were to proceed off the bottom uh, bottom left corner of this map, you would eventually run to the Danish peninsula. So what you have is uh, uh, eventually, we'll get to this, it hasn't happened yet, but eventually we'll have Prussia down here. Uh, here is uh, the Bay of Riga, the city of Riga here, and you'll notice there's a series of fortresses here marked on this map, fortresses and churches. Uh, uh, bishops' castles, which might sound a little, a little bit surprising. We think of bishop, we think of the church now as pacifists, but of course, this period in time, churchmen could be quite uh, feisty. And the uh, sword brothers, the crusading order of sword brothers, adhering to the bishop of Riga, are effectively a private army of the bishop. So he, he uh, conquers the uh, Divina River Valley here, basically, and they begin to colonize. Uh, begin to colonize off the southeast of the Bay of Riga. Up here, right up on the northwest corner, uh, north of this dotted line here, is the what would become the Danish Duchy of Estonia, up here. So, so far we've seen from the Northern Crusades the emergence of, of uh, what would become a, a couple of different states in modern times. This is the basis, of course, of modern uh, Latvia, and this is the basis up here of modern Estonia. Now I'm going to uh, jump back to the Mediterranean for a moment, because the uh, Crusading Order, the Teutonic Knights, aren't yet in the picture, but they will uh, be coming about pretty quick. Uh, back in the Mediterranean, the uh, Crusader states set up after the First Crusade are struggling by the late 12th century. Uh, rather famously, on the of particular importance, I should say, on 4th of July, 1187, the Battle of Hattin occurs, which the Christian Kingdom of Jerusalem and its army is crushed, uh, you know, roundly defeated uh, at a, a place called Hattin. It still exists. You can look it up on Google Maps. But they're they're roundly defeated by a uh, an Islamic army. Jerusalem falls on the 2nd of October, 1187. This leads to the calling of the Third Crusade uh, by Pope Gregory VIII, who hopes to to uh, uh, hopes to rescue the situation. So he proclaims this crusade to the Holy Land, and he uh, approaches uh, uh, Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, uh, who, uh, in effect, is is on the outs with the Pope at that time. In fact, he ends up uh, excommunicated, but it doesn't stop him raising 100,000 men from the Holy, uh, from Germany, but as it's called in the Middle Ages, the Holy Roman Empire. He raises 100,000 men uh, and he heads down to Levant. He arrives there in 1189, 
uh, unfortunately he dies in 10 June uh, 1190 uh, but the Germans carry on to uh, uh, participate in the siege of Acre in 1190-91 and that city becomes a kind of uh, enduring strong point uh, for some time going forward they, they, they kind of rescue the Crusader states from complete complete destruction but they're reduced to really a little strip on the coast now these uh, German soldiers when they get to the Near East uh, dysentery uh, and fever are rampant they decimate the German army uh, here at the bottom is a, a contemporary depiction or a little later depiction of the siege of Acre down here it's a nice trebuchet there Now, in response to the, the kind of suffering and uh, a lack of medical care for the Germans uh, in the Near East, uh, we see the foundation of the Order of the Hospital of St. Mary of the Germans in Jerusalem. And that is the formal long name for what we call the Teutonic Knights. Uh, as William Urban in his uh, monograph, The Teutonic Knights, writes, quote, uh, the establishment of the Teutonic Order was an act of desperation. Desperation based not on a lack of fighting men, but on ineffective medical care. So it all sounds rather laudable. Uh, how does this group eventually become a, a conquering crusading force in Northeast Europe, one might ask? Well, the uh, German knights and men at the Siege of Acre, uh, they lack access uh, to... Uh, aid to food, they don't have a place to recover from their wounds or bury the dead. Uh, the dead are actually uh, thrown into the moat at Acre. Uh, it's a dreadful situation. In 1190, crusaders from Bremen and Lübeck uh, decide to found a hospital. This is supported by various German nobles and the Patriarch of Jer Jerusalem, uh, who's the head priest in the Holy Land, effectively. And uh, it's founded a uh, along the lines of the, the already pre-existing orders, crusading orders of the Hospitlers and Templars, who uh, were defenders of the Holy Land, but whose own work focused on uh, creating safe passage for pilgrims to get to and from the Holy Land. Pope Celestine III approves the foundation of the Order of Teutonic Knights. They adopt the same rules to live by of, of uh, celibacy and devotion to God uh, that the Knights Templar used. In 1197, a new Ger German Crusader army arrives, including a contingent from Bremen who la lavish even more support uh, on the existing order. And that support often comes in the form of donations of land back in Germany, the profits of which are used to support the the uh, what they see as the good charitable works of the uh, fighting uh, order of Teutonic Knights in the Holy Land. Now this organization might have foundered, there are some other uh, sort of now very little known crusading orders which are uh, started but then don't go anywhere in this time period, but a really clever chap by the name of Hermann von Salza becomes head of the order uh, in 1210 and he really is personally responsible for getting it off the ground and making it secure. He's a friend and advisor to the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II, uh, and it, he becomes master at a time that the Teutonic Order is a bit shaky, really financially and in terms of uh, poor recruitment. In the in the year 1211, uh, he sends forces uh, to Hungary from the Order to help uh, to help defend uh, Transylvania against uh, a different group of pagans. Cuman pagans, and these are Turkic people. And by doing so, he, he finds a kind of niche for his crusading order, that they're going to go do something different that, that the other crusading orders don't. Uh, and the reality is that the Holy Land is, is quickly slipping away, slipping out of the hands uh, of Christian peoples there anyway. And so the, the place for the uh, the 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 role of the Crusading Order of Teutonic Knights is, is kind of fading out, and so he, he needs to sort of find some important mission they can do for you know the good of Christianity, and this is what he thinks it is. Uh, Hermann Waltz also 
that accompanies Frederick II on the fifth uh, crusade, which is one that goes to Egypt in, in 1219. He serves Frederick II as a diplomat to the Pope uh, from 1222. He manages to squeeze from Honorius III a grant of equal status for the Teutonic Knights, uh, equal with other crusading orders. And uh, the order really gets off the ground. The close association between the Holy Roman Emperor and von Salsa means he's in a position to recruit, to get donors, to round up young men to join the order. And uh, these resources pour into Hungary, and they begin to really establish themselves there and control broad swathes of territory on the Hungarian border. And the Hungarian nobles uh, get worried that these traps are going to form for themselves a, a crusader state there and effectively take take uh, land from what's traditionally thought of as Hungary and, and annex it to be a new crusader state. And so the, the Hungarian nobles turf them out, basically. Now, uh, on this map you can see here, so here's Acre and the Holy Land down here. Uh, here's Bremen, uh, which is actually pretty close to the border of uh, pagan lands up here. This is where the donors, the main donors to the Teutonic Order come from. Uh, and here is, uh, here's Kuban territory and this shaded bit at the edge of Hungary is where the Teutonic Knights had operated there. Uh, but you can see they're effectively working towards home. So the Holy Land, the, the Christians are being turfed out, they begin to participate in defending Hungary against the uh, Cuban people, pagan Cuban peoples. Uh, they're then uh, turfed out of there by the nobles, and eventually they land up here uh, from 1230, just here where we'll be going on the trip, of course, in what would become uh, their lands in Prussia. Meanwhile, in Poland, so there's a lot of jumping around here geographically, but uh, you are getting the story chronologically, more or less. Meanwhile, in Poland, uh, Conrad I, uh, Duke of Masovia. Now, Masovia is that bit of Poland which borders uh, Prussia, just outside of that uh, black circle on the previous map. Now, he's the son of the King of Poland, uh, and he's the, the you know, as Duke of Masovia, this northern region of, of Poland, uh, he really has almost complete autonomy and control there. And his lands are bounded on the north uh, by the river Vistula, beyond which are pagan uh, Prussians, which are quite a warlike and reasonably sophisticated people. And so they've managed to resist his efforts to uh, install political control there for quite some time. During the Livonian Crusade, uh, that's one of these northern crusades, uh, in 1209 he attacks uh, old Prussia, uh, these pagan lands just north of the, the Vistula, uh, near a place called Helmno. He, he, there had been a church there, and it's the old, well, I'm going up there to defend the, the Christians uh, type of affair. Uh, Pope Innocent III had given him approval to do this in advance. Uh, he's pretty unsuccessful. Uh, in 1215, Christian of Olivia, a Cistercian monk uh, from Kubach Abbey, uh, is named Misha is named bishop and missionary to old Prussia. Uh, Christian is put to flight and his church is ravaged in 1216. Uh, Conrad fails to reconquer the area uh, and between 1219 and 1226 uh, pagan Prussians not only have they uh, turfed out uh, Christian of Livia not only have they resisted the Duke of Masovia they begin raiding into Masovia into Christian Polish lands. give you another map here to bring you up to speed on this. Uh, so if we were to follow left from this map you'd reach the base of the Danish Peninsula. Uh, if you were to follow up and right from this you would reach uh, Riga and eventually Estonia. So here we are in, uh, this is a map of uh, what is medieval Prussia, what would become the state of the Teutonic Knights. Uh, this is Masovia here uh, which is Christian Polish land and here is the River Vistula, and just here, Helmno and Torun. This is the very first point of military contact 
between uh, both the uh, Christian Poles, Masovi, and eventually uh, between the Teutonic Order and pagan Prussians. So Torda and where we're going here is right on the river Vistula, and it's it, together with Helmno, were the first outposts of uh, Christian Poles and uh, particularly Germans in this in this area. Well, uh, Conrad of Masovia and uh, Hermann von Salsa, they come to an they come to an agreement. Uh, in 1226, Conrad makes contact with Hermann and seeks help. Surely, knowing of the way in which the Teutonic Order had fought back the Cumin pagans on behalf of the Hungarian nobles, he invites them to come in. Uh, but Conrad, jaded from the 1225 expulsion from Hungary by the Hungarian nobles, he wants secure rights to his conqu conquests. Uh, Hermann, is act uh, Hermann, at the same time, is acting as uh, German Emperor Frederick II's envoy to the papacy, and so he goes for a kind of a triple lock agreement. He wants to be absolutely certain that whatever the Teutonic Knights conquer, they get to keep this time. So he seeks the so-called Golden Bowl of Rimini uh, from Frederick II. Uh, this is uh, in March 1226. It says, uh, to our trusty brother Herman, our trusty brother Herman has explained that our devoted Con uh, Conrad, Duke of Masovia, has promised and undertaken to provide to him and his brethren from that land, which is called Helmno land, uh, that they may thus indeed uh, take up the task and readily embark upon the inv invasion and obtaining of the land of Prussia for the honor and glory of the true God. Uh, we therefore, uh, trusting also in the judgment of the same master, this being Master Herman Salsa, uh, because he is a man mighty both in deed, uh, set forth, grant the land of Prussia to the same master along with the forces of his order and with all those who think to invade it. So this is a carte blanche here to go and uh, go and conquer those lands and he'll get them. Uh, he makes the Treaty of uh, uh, Kruschwitz with Conrad I in May of 1230 in which Conrad recognizes the Teutonic Order's independent rule beyond uh, beyond Poland, which in, in those days was anything uh, beyond the Viswa at that point, beyond the Vistula. And uh, finally, we have the Golden Bowl of uh, uh, Reiti from Gregory the Ninth, which confirms all of this. Uh, Gregory recognizes the Teutonic Order's lands to be subject only to the Pope and no other worldly ruler. So he really goes out of his way to make sure what they get they're going to keep. Uh, and it's going to be uh, all free and clear, unlike what happened in uh, Hungary, where they'd spent a lot of money, built some castles, and then got turfed out. So the Teutonic Knights finally arrive uh, in Prussia after the, the last of these treaties is signed. In, uh, uh, and on 16 June 1230, they begin operations there. Initially, as few as 300 knights and squires arrive in 1230, and they set up a camp uh, on the Vistula, opposite where the future uh, city of Tordern uh, would be located. Mind you, when you see 300 knights, uh, every knight is going to have a certain number of uh, basic uh, footmen, basic military soldiers with them. Maybe they'll have a squire each that takes the number to 600. Maybe each one will be supported by you know, maybe four or five, a retinue of four or five uh, sort of hirelings or mercenaries. You know, this number becomes, it multiplies out to probably a couple thousand anyway. By 1233, enough land had been taken to found uh, the uh, cities of Torun and Helmno, as identified on the last map I showed you there, and they're issued. Uh, they're issued a, a town, char town charters which guarantee them anyone who goes and settles there uh, economic privileges, some land outside of town, uh, trading rights with other cities up the river, down the river, and so forth. 
And there's a certain assumption here that, that the people who come and take up these advantageous uh, tax breaks to found a town there will be uh, other German persons, uh, which in effect they are for a very long time uh, after this period. Even into the 1400s, the number of non-Germans who are property-owning townsmen in Torun, for example, is, is still down around 15%. So it really is a German colony uh, that's being founded here. So that's it for this lecture. Uh, do try and prepare for the quiz. Uh, it'll cover the most sort of general points uh, of the lecture. Don't worry about the exact wording of uh, documents.